All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Tuesday to you all. Uh, welcome to him to university uh, Tuesday edition. Uh, I am. I am excited to be on this morning. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I should have picked them up from you on Sunday, but I've got I've got a couple leashes here as well. Um, let's make sure that I'll get them back to you before Thursday in case you might need them. <laughs> Morning, bro. Good to see you. Um, I'm excited to be on today. Um, this chapter is going to be very good for us. Um, and there's only there is only one way to achieve what we're going to talk about in this chapter um, and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, and I'm, again, I'm excited. Uh, so uh, I pray that you all, uh, I, I, I pray that you all are doing the work also right in private. And what I mean uh, specifically as it pertains to what we do here on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays that you guys are reading too. Right. Um, oftentimes um, there is a, there's a strange codependency on people um, in ministry, people in in leadership, people um, who may have more time uh, spent in the word than you. And, and I want to caution you. I want to admonish you. I want to uh, warn you. Do not become dependent on us. Please don't depend on us. OK. Not because we will intentionally do anything to deter you from the truth of Jesus Christ or uh, do anything intentionally to hurt you spiritually. That's not our aim. That's not what we're about. Right. We're going to deal with that in this chapter. Um, but we want you to depend on the sufficiency of Christ and the spirit that resides in you because you have accepted the salvation provided by Jesus's work on the cross. That's what we want you to do. We don't want you to trust us. We want you to trust him, right? Him and him alone. All we're here on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays to do is to give to you what the spirit is revealing to us, right? I mean, yes, trust us to some degree, but not at the expense of you only hear our voices, right? No, we want you to learn how to hear his voice more than you hear us. Right. So please, please, please don't become codependent on us. Uh, Paul, Peter, uh, the apostles, they made it very clear. Moses made it very clear um, in his time leading the, the children of Israel. Listen, I did not deliver you out of Egypt. So don't become dependent on me. Right. We did not deliver you from the bondage of sin, ladies and gentlemen. We were delivered by the same Jesus Christ that you were. All right. And that's who we're here to exalt, exalt and to lift up. All right. Um, because it is it is the the codependency of the American culture that uh, has led to what we're going to see here in chapter number two of Second Peter on today. So let's pray as there is a few things to discuss and then we'll get into this thing. Father, this uh, this chapter today, uh, as you spoke through the Apostle Peter, is uh, it's a heavy hitter. Um, it will likely offend some people i uh, will likely make people question what they've been doing um it may cause people to re-examine their motives it may cause people to re-examine their aim their goals their values um and father i pray that through a demonstration of the spirit's power not through eloquent words not through um great analogies but father through a demonstration of the spirit's power that you would speak to us today. Father, that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that resides in each and every one of our hearts, Father, as your word is proclaimed this morning, that it would resonate and it would do what only the spirit is here to do, and that is to glorify the son as the son glorifies the father, and in so doing, we become more like your son, Jesus the Christ. So whatever that looks like, whether it is rebuke, whether it is conviction, whatever is necessary in the moment, in this moment today, to make us more like you. It is such a, it's a dangerous thing to say because you know what it will take to get us to be more like you. 
And I don't utter this out of self-righteousness. I don't utter this out of um, an attempt to sound deep. But Father, we know what the cost of discipleship is. And few, 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 few people are willing to pay it. So Father, be with us during this time. Speak through me by your spirit, your spirit alone in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So I uh, called this video today. Can you spot the fake? Can you spot the fake? Um, years ago, when I worked at a bank, I was fresh out of high school. Um, we went through counterfeit detection training um, and I was a I was a teller. I was a commercial teller. And um, oftentimes we had businesses that would come in with large, large sums of money, uh, not like, you know, fifty dollars here, a hundred dollars there, a couple hundred dollars. Now we're talking about several thousands of dollars that they would deposit. And there would be times that uh, they would their restaurants or their businesses would take in counterfeit bills. Right. And we had a uh, we had some manual ways to detect a counterfeit bill. We would look for certain striping or um, uh, the way the serial numbers ran, things like that. We could hold it up to uh, the light in the room and, and some bills, right, that were not um, as expertly counterfeited. counterfeited. Uh, we could catch that with the naked eye. But, but then there were times when our eyes wouldn't be able to detect the the counterfeit. But when we put it on a certain machine um, and it began, we put it on the money counter, right? And it began to run the bills through by the thousands, right? It would count, 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 count. And then it would spit out the counterfeit. Why? Because there was a little more advanced technology, um, whether it was, it was infrared, uh, it was an ultraviolet, uh, a UV ray, and then um, this other thing that detects like the magnetic strips, right? There were like three different pieces of of, tech, of advanced technology within this money counter that would detect a counterfeit bill. And it was nothing that we did wrong, right? Our eyes were just not that advanced to catch the counterfeit, right? And uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to deal with today, again, the title of this video is Can You Spot the Fake? Can you spot the fake? It is without question that there are leaders, that there are uh, people in leadership positions. There are pastors um, who are over flocks of people today um, that are counterfeits, that are fakes. Um, they are not in position um, in order to take care of the flock. They are in position to set the flock up for for feast to set the to set the flock up in order to um, feed off of them as ravenous wolves, as Christ um, talked about when he was here on the earth dealing with the disciples, right? And I want to be very clear that the people who Peter is about to be referring to here, right? These are people who are, who are intentionally in place in order to deceive people. Right. We're not going to we're not dealing with people who have um, maybe uh, misinterpreted something and said something wrong right from the pulpit or in leadership. No, these are people whose sole aim is to deceive others. Right. They that is that's it. Right. And so we're going to see a few things today on how we can spot the fakes within the body of Christ. Right. Because there are some very distinguishing um, uh, characteristics that we have to look for. Right. And this only comes through discipleship. Right. Because if all we're teaching is for how people uh, uh, if all we're teaching is charisma. Right. If that's all we've got is charisma. Hey, Val, good to see you this morning. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If all we're teaching is religious activity, okay? If all we're teaching is 
um, praise breaks and shouts. And don't get me wrong, I'm not downing those things at all. But when those things take precedence, when the when the charisma, when the charismatic movement takes precedence over the exaltation of Jesus Christ and the exaltation of Jesus Christ within the life of the believer, when all of those things take precedence over the development, the discipleship of the person, getting them from where they have started and getting them to where they look more like Jesus Christ, when we place more emphasis on those things, then we do our own personal development as disciples of Jesus Christ. We will not be able to spot the fakes. Okay. We will not be able to spot the fakes. And it's very dangerous. These, these types of people are very, very dangerous to the body of Christ. There's an old, uh, there's a picture of, um, of an ax. And um, he's, the ax is flipped upside down, right? He's behind a podium, he's flipped upside down. And all these trees, right, are looking at this ax up behind this podium. And just because he looks like them, they believe that he's one of them because he has a wooden handle. But the picture zooms out more you see that on the bottom, right, hidden behind the pulpit, there's the blade and the entire forest around him has been chopped down. But this ax is able to sell the lie because he's hiding the blade. And he's only showing the wooden handle. So he's giving them a piece that looks like them, but secretly hidden behind the pulpit is, is the very blade that is that has destroyed the forest, All right? And um, I paraphrase that, by the way, but you get the idea of what of what I'm saying. He was able to convince them that he was not the problem, right? That it was something else, but the whole time he was the problem. And that is the danger of these false teachers. All right, it's the danger of these false teachers. So let's go to Second Peter chapter number one it uh second i'm sorry first second peter chapter number two verse one it says but there were also false prophets in israel just as there will be false teachers among you they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them in this way they will bring sudden destruction on themselves the first thing i want to point out here is that we must understand that false teachers will be around okay they'll be around there is no way for us to prevent this falsehood from happening right we cannot stop false teachers from arising all of this is necessary okay and you say aaron how do you know that it's necessary let's go to deuteronomy chapter number 13 because peter just said that there were also false prophets among the people in israel all right now by this time the lord has been very clear um let's go back to let's go back to chapter eight just really quickly uh let's go to chapter number eight And let's look at verse number three for the sake of time. It says, sorry, verse two, it says, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry, then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So by this time, God has made it very clear that you don't live just by what you can see, but you live based off of my word. Right. And God had promised him that he would take them to the to Canaan. Right. And he validated this promise 
by making sure they did not die of hunger in the wilderness by what feeding them manna what to teach them that they do not live just by what they can see or what they can eat but they live based off the promises the word of god now let's slide to deuteronomy chapter number 13 um, now that we have the base established, look at this. Suppose there are prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs or miracles and the predicted signs or miracles occur. Uh Oh, if they then say. Come, let us worship other gods, gods you have not known before. Do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice and cling to him. The false prophets or visionaries who try to lead you astray must be put to death for they encourage rebellion against the Lord, your God who redeemed you from slavery and brought you out of the land of Egypt. Since they try to lead you astray from the Lord your God, from the way the Lord your God commanded you to live, you must put them to death. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you. So he says, listen, that there will be prophets among you, right? Second Peter verse one says that just like there was in Israel. God makes it clear. You all live based off of my word and my word alone. And one of those words was. Worship. The Lord your God only, right? You shall have no other gods before me. That's in Exodus, right? The very first command. So here it is. He says that even if a prophet comes to you and what they say comes to pass, if it is then followed by, let's go and worship this other God because of the sign that occurred, God says that prophet is to be put to death. That prophet is to be put to death. Now, I'm not saying today you kill that person. That's not what I'm saying. What I am pointing out is the validation between what Peter is saying and what God has said here in Deuteronomy chapter number 13, right? That he will allow it. He may allow the sign to happen. He may allow it to occur, come to pass. But the purpose is to test to see, am I going to follow the sign or am I going to follow Christ? Am I going to follow God? Right. Because, again, when Jonathan Jambres, Jambres, right, they were they were neck and neck. Toe to toe with Moses, with all these different signs until it got to right down to the nitty gritty. They said, now, hold on, wait a minute. We can't do this. This is definitely the finger of God. Exodus chapter number nine. Right. And so, again, we must understand that there will be false prophets. There will be things, uh, false teachers. There will be things that happen that may look really, really good. It may look really, really close. But then you have to check the temperature of your heart, right? And if after seeing these signs, these wonders, hearing these inflated sermons, all of this stuff, these egotistical sermons, and it begins to draw your heart away from the truth of who Jesus Christ is, Houston, whatever city we live, you live in, we have a problem. So he says, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. What is heresy? Heresy is anything that is opposite of a, of an established religious uh, doctrine, right? An established religious truth. Peter has made it clear, abundantly clear that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation right? We are saved by um, faith alone, through grace alone, from the teachings of the Apostle Paul, right? Um, their teachings are centered around Christ plus nothing. It is only Jesus the Christ. But these false teachers, they will begin to, again, not, these people are not unskilled. They're very skilled in what they do. They will cleverly teach destructive 
heresies, and in so doing, it will deny the very master who bought them. Now, this raises a problem uh, in the minds of some people because they say, well, wait a minute, I thought these people are unsaved. They are unsaved, right? And so this brings to light the fact that atonement is available for all. However, if you do not believe, therefore you do not receive. So again, when Christ died, he died to save the world, but not everybody will accept the salvation that he provides. So that is what this means here by denying the very master who bought them, not just in word, but also in deed. That's why you have to start people at zero. To, and, and my brother taught me this a long time ago. You always start everybody at zero and you give time for their behaviors to develop because people are very good um, at fooling people with their words. And because in the church we are biblically illiterate, right? We lack discipleship. We are we are not good at detecting the fakes when they come around. Let's go to John chapter number 10 and we'll we'll, we'll get this ball rolling a little bit quicker. Um, John chapter number 10. And we find these words from the Savior. And it reads. Um, let's see here. Where did I want to go? Where did I want to go? Let's go to 27. Mm -hmm. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me. And he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. The father and I are one and then he's and then uh let's slide back up because there it is um i'm sorry verse number uh one i tell you the truth anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber but the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out after he has gathered his own flock. He walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastors. Listen here. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now, the thief here is not the devil. Okay. The thief here is false teachers. The thief here is false teachers, right? Jesus says that my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. The problem today that we see in the church is that we do not know what Jesus has said, right? We only hang on things like we're two or three together in my name. I'll be there in the midst. You can, you can cast a mountain into the sea. Greater works than this will you do. But we've not learned how to hear his voice. We've not learned his behaviors. We've not learned how he lived his life. We have not learned what it means for us to be a disciple, to be a student of him. We only want the miraculous. We want to see the miracles, the signs, the wonders. We want to see the press down, shaken together, all out of context. But we don't want the adaptation to his lifestyle. We don't want the giving up of our life for his life. We want the benefits that he provides, but we don't want to go through the process of discipleship. And so, therefore, we struggle when it comes to this, this false teaching because we don't know what the word says. 
Well, then we think, oh, well, they looked the part. They sound really good. Well, it must be the truth, right? My sons, my sons, my sons, um, they know their Uncle Brenton, right? They know their Uncle Brenton very well. And there is nothing that I could say to them um, or that anybody else could say to them about their Uncle Brenton that they, they would say, you know, Uncle Brenton said this or Uncle Brenton said that. And if they struggled to understand or struggled to verify, right, what that was, do you know who they would come see? They would come see their father. Why? Because their father is in relationship with their Uncle Brenton, right? They wouldn't just take it at face value and 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 use it as the gospel, right? Hey, Dad, somebody said this about Uncle Brenton, right? And then I have the opportunity to verify and let them know, well, no, that's not the truth, right? Ladies and gentlemen, because we have not developed this relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, I say because we have not developed a relationship. Uh, let me let me rewind that back a little bit. Because the vast majority, we are not developing a relationship or deepening the relationship with Jesus Christ. There are things being said to us about Christ that if it fits your bent, well, then you go with it, right? Some think that Jesus carries an AR-15. Again, wearing, wearing the cape of the American flag. Um, we have Christ wrapped in an American flag. Or we have Christ on the far left side of the spectrum as all inclusive, as an all inclusive resort, right? Come, don't change your lifestyle, live however you want to live, love who you want to love, do whatever you want to do because we got salvation for all, baby. Just come on in, right? And so, whatever our bent is, that's what we, that's where we kind of cling to Christ, right? And these false teachers, they know this. They know this and they capitalize on this and it is a problem. But because we don't know his voice, well, then we are being led astray by these false teachers. All right. Let's look at this. Um, it says many will follow their evil teaching and same shameful immorality. And because of these false teachers, the way of the truth will be slandered in greed. They will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money, but God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. It says that people will follow them. Why? Because it will play to the proclivities in their heart, right? Again, um, Paul warned Timothy in the last days, people will heap for themselves teachers who will itch their ears, right? Teachers who will not push them toward discipleship, but teachers who will allow them to continue to live any way that they want to live. As long as you profess Jesus Christ, come on in, brother. Now let's go live however we want to live, right? These people are opposite, are everything opposite of what Christ is. Everything opposite. But again, they, they worm their way in through charisma. They are great orators. They can speak very, very well. Right? And I don't mean any disrespect when I say this, but ignorant people, biblically illiterate people, are being duped because of these great orators. Right? But let, let's keep moving because there's a few more things that we need to deal with. Again, it says that um, they will make up in their greed. They will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. Uh oh. Uh oh. If again, there are there are pastors, and I and I thank the Lord for Creflo Dollar because he has publicly stepped out and said this has been some some months ago. He has publicly stated that I for years taught tithing in error. And he did. He he acknowledged where he was 
where he had misinterpreted the scriptures for over 20 something years right now there's other things that could be said about it but at least he acknowledged that he was teaching in error right there's a difference between what creflo did and then these people here it says they will make up clever lies to get your money right they will twist they will intentionally distort the scriptures in order to get a hold of your money i've heard a preacher say that some of y'all are sick because you ain't given no money that is a lie if you ain't given no money you are cursed with a curse okay sir please stop taking that old testament passage and twisting it in order to guilt people into giving money and unfortunately he was successful now am i saying he was a false teacher i'm not saying that he was intentionally trying to dupe people could have just been a misunderstanding again these next few verses are going to show us why we shouldn't worry about them all right and you say aaron why what do you mean we shouldn't worry all right look at this so these first few verses right that we we see how to spot them and we're going to look at some more ways to spot them verses four through six my next point that i want to tell us in spotting the fake don't fight it don't fight it you know when we would when we would determine counterfeit bills in the bank and um we would we would have the customer there or we would miss it with our with the naked eye and then we would see it later you know what we would do all we would do is deduct that from whatever the transaction was we didn't call and make a big fuss didn't call and say you did this for us you you gave us counterfeit bills you're the worst part we didn't do any of that and then when they would ask a question hey my deposit short we would say uh we unfortunately we detected a counterfeit bill in your deposit and we you know we deducted the, the transaction by this amount and we moved on why because it's a part of business it happens right look at verses four it says for god did not spare even the angels who sinned he threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment and god did not spare the ancient world Except for Noah and the seven others in his family, Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and he turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not our job to stand up and go find and fight every false teacher that we may come in contact with. Aaron, well then, well then what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to continue to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We are supposed to continue our spiritual development. Not go on a winch hunt to get all these guys out of office and out of leadership and no, 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 no. What did Christ tell Peter to do? Which is exactly what Peter's doing right now. He said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know, I love you feed my sheep. So wherever God has planted you, right? Whatever sphere of influence that you have, don't worry about what the false teachers are doing. It's not our job to go and, and stand up in the middle of the church and cause a big scene and commotion and all this. No, 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 no. But if that false teacher is within your realm of influence, oh, yeah, then you can pull them to the side and have a conversation with them. But again, these men and these women, this is this is what they're going to do. The Bible's making it clear. False teachers are going to be out there. And Peter is warning the people because why? He doesn't want the people to be led astray by them. And that's all we're doing today. We're talking about how do we spot the fakes under the name of Christianity? How do we spot the fakes who are claiming to be one thing, but they're living an entirely different way? How do we spot the fakes that are intentionally distorting the word of God in order to make a profit off of other people? Peter is laying this out for us. Destructive heresies, teachings that are in stark opposition with what Christ was teaching. People say all the time, uh, you know, preachers, they like to say, well, you know, Jesus talked about money a whole lot. 
Did he though? Did he talk about money the same way that you talk about money today? Where it's almost coming off as seasoned with greed? That it's all about the money. We got to get the money. Because if we don't get the money, well, then we can't do anything else. We can't do no ministry. Oof. I beg to differ. The scriptures beg to differ. Because Jesus didn't go around asking people for money. Now, there were people who supported Christ. There were people who supported Paul. But it wasn't because he had his hand out saying, we need the money. But again, you've got false teachers on TV in pulpits today saying, members mark water. I've prayed over this. And if you drink this bottle of water, whatever's going on in your body, you will be healed. Twenty nine ninety nine. That's just one example, right? So again, I, I, I'm not here to play. Let's deal with these scriptures. Um, so again, verses four through six, we understand that God has got this under control, right? It's not our job to fight them, but it is our job to make sure that we remain firm in the truth. Let's go to Colossians chapter number three. Uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter number two. Here it is. It says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Let's stop for a second and let's look at how many times the word him was mentioned here. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus. So starts it off as your Lord, right? Not just Savior, but as Lord. Savior is one thing. Lord is Headship, right? Lord over your life. You must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. None of those need to be deducted, right? That we are to follow him. We are to let our roots grow down into him. And then we are to let our lives be built on him. Right? Not built on religious activity, not built on... um all these other charismatic things. No, this is all about Jesus, the Christ. Here it is. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So our faith only grows strong, strong when we keep it. Uh Oh, let's go to Hebrews chapter number 12, verse three, where the writer says, after he has dealt with all the examples of faith in chapter 11, he says, now let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, who is what the author and the perfecter of our faith here in Colossians chapter two, it says, then after we have let our roots, after we follow him, after we continue to follow him, after we let our roots grow down into him, and after we allow our lives to be built on him, it is then that our faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Our faith only grows stronger as we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the Christ, and the stronger our faith, the stronger our ability to detect the fakes in front of us. So our job is not to fight them. Our job is to stay in the proverbial gym. We're not supposed to go on this crusade. We're going to slay down the false teachers. No, Peter didn't tell these people to go fight them. Peter focused on personal development so that they would be able to detect when they were around these false teachers. Again, um, working on it here in within the family, um, certain words that we'll use that my kids will be able to use with their mother and I, um, should they be in a situation and somebody approaches them and that is a stranger and they, you know, try to tell them, Hey, you know, your mom and dad told me to, I'm picking you up from school today, or, you know, you're supposed to come to my house. I'm a good friend of your dad's a good friend of your mom's, whatever, whatever. Right. They get in a stranger situation and, um, the words that my kids will use or that they'll have to hear or they'll ask a question a certain question that only the four of us in the family will know 
And therefore, if that person cannot answer that question, they say, oh, oh, oh nope, not going with you. Right. Ladies, is this, ladies and gentlemen, it's the same thing within the scriptures. Right. We have to be so in tune with who Christ is. That we know when somebody says something, oh, wait a minute, no, 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 that doesn't register. That's not the Christ that I serve. That's not who is the Lord of my life. And so, again, the th first three things we see these people, they introduce destructive heresies and lies. They lie because they're greedy. Right. And then the next thing that we're going to see down here in verse number. Um, verse number 13, I believe. Uh, verse number 10, it says. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. So they have no they have no respect for God's authority, for um, the angels. Uh, again, it says that they scoff at supernatural beings and that being the angels, that being uh demons because they're all supernatural right there is no regard for them look at what the the text says but the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings right so again they scoff at uh the devil and his uh and his minions right but again, the, the point here is the fact that all these things were created by God and by them scoffing at them, they are now being blasphemous toward the creator who is God. Just other things to to keep your eyes open um, about. All right. So look at this. Uh, let's go to verse number 13. It says their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Uh oh, so these might be people that are sitting down at your table. Your fellowship meals, right? Again, they have the appearance that they are with you, but they are not really with you because their deeds over time tell you who they really are. So they are inconsistent in their behaviors. Inconsistent with the with the pattern of Jesus Christ, yet consistent in their sinful nature. It says they commit adultery with their eyes and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin and they are well trained in greed. There's that word greed again. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right path, off the right road, and follow the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. So again, these people, they commit adultery with their eyes, right? They are lustful. Um, they are using their charisma. They are using their platform. They are using um, their sphere of influence to satisfy their selfish sinful desires right these are people who have who lack self-control and we know that self-control is only attainable through the power of the holy spirit in our struggle against sin yet if these people are unsaved there is no residing of the holy spirit so their desires are running rampant and running loose and yet because they are in positions of authority and power they are able to lure unstable people look at it what it says unstable people into sin matthew 7 24 christ makes it clear that those who hear his words and actually do them they are like a man who built his house upon the solid rock. So when the winds and the waves came, the house was not destroyed. But everyone who hears my words and do, does not take them to heart, does not build on them, is like a man who built his house on the sinking sand so that when the winds and the waves came, the house was destroyed. Again, do we see that the foundation in order to spot the fake, we have to be built on Jesus Christ and Christ alone, Christ in totality, not Christ just for salvation but christ in our salvation christ in our sanctification and then those things lead to the personification right 
in our thoughts, in our behaviors, our attitudes. Philippians 2, 5 says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The very way that we begin to think starts to starts to look like what we read about Christ in the scriptures. Right. And so let's keep moving. Um, it says they are well trained in greed. Again, these people are skilled at this. Great salesmen. They don't push you to become like Christ. They don't. They don't push us to see because, again, they don't they don't teach how to hear Christ's voice. They don't teach how to become more like Christ, because the more that you become like Christ, the more that the veil is pulled off of your eyes and you're able to see them for who they really are. So they'll keep you cloaked. Listen to me very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. They will keep you cloaked with religious activity. They will keep you cloaked with charisma. They will keep you cloaked with all these other things that are going on. It's almost like a sleight of hand. They'll show you over here what looks good, but secretly over here, they are ravenous wolves. We've got time. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter number eight. Ezekiel chapter number eight, and uh, we'll, we'll deal with this for just a moment. Ezekiel chapter number eight, we find these words. Um, let's go here. Verse number seven, it says, then he brought me to the door of the temple uh, courtyard where I where I could see a hole in the wall. He said to me, now, son of man, dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and found a hidden doorway into the temple. Go in, he said, and see the wicked, detestable sins they are committing in there. So I went in and saw the walls covered with engravings of all kinds of crawling animals and detestable creatures. I also saw the various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. Seventy leaders of Israel were standing there with Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, in the center. Each of them held an incense burner from which a cloud of incense rose above their heads. Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the leaders of Israel are doing with their idols in the dark room. They are saying the Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. So now we have idolatry in the temple, right? So he speaks to him. He says, listen, he says, I want you to see this hole in the wall, Ezekiel. Dig into that hole. Tell me what you see. So on the front in public, everything looks good, right? These are the leaders of Israel, but behind where nobody can see, you see the reality of their hearts and they are worshiping idols. They are giving in to these insatiable desires. There's no different than the false teachers that we are seeing Peter talk about here in second Peter chapter number two, again, verse 14 says that they commit adultery with their eyes and their desire for sin is never satisfied. It says they have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. I don't have time to go there, but please go read Numbers chapter 22 through 24, and you will see um, this prophet, not a prophet of God, but just one who consulted the dark arts um, through divination. Um, you'll see that, that story laid out there. All right, so verse number 17, it says, um, these people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to the blackest to to the blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped a lifestyle of deception. Now, the picture here in verse number 17 is useless as dried up springs is, uh, or mist blown away by the wind. The picture here is like uh, clouds, uh, just thunderheads, right? Just thunder clouds, uh, but they don't produce any rain. They make a lot of noise, but there is no rain. There is no um, there is nothing positive produced from them. Right. You know, you've ever been. Where you where you've seen clouds, it's like, man, it's fixing to be a really bad storm or a really good rain, right? And all you get is thunder. 
not a drop of rain. That's what these false teachers are able to do. They make a lot of noise, but they they provide absolutely nothing that is beneficial to your spiritual growth. The only thing they can do is play to the desires of your sinful heart. That's all that they can do. The way that they teach, the way that they preach, the way that they conduct themselves. Listen, now, we all know what happened with Hillsong, right? I don't know Carl Lentz's motives, and I'm not here to bash the guy. He has been on a sabbatical. He has um, repented from what we see, from what we hear. And so, again, I'm not going to bash this guy over the head because I don't know him personally. But what I will say is that some of these characteristics looking real similar, right? Looking real similar. And it's not up to me to judge him. As we saw in verses four to six, God will judge him, right? But again, just things like that. You start seeing operations like that. Keep your eyes on those things and don't get caught up in this swell of charisma and ultimately get led away from Jesus Christ. All right, so uh, verse 17, yes, so they make a lot of noise, but they produce nothing of value to your lives. Uh, with an appeal to twisted, twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness, of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. I want to speak to this very quickly because, as many of you know, I've shared very openly, um, uh, there was a time in my life that I was addicted to uh, painkillers, oxycodone to be specific, um, and it's really just synthetic heroin, honestly, um, if you look at the the ingredients, the way that it's made. Uh, there was a time when I was heavily addicted to uh, those painkillers. Right. And um, I had a problem with codependency. Um, the pain wasn't as bad as what I imagined it to be. But the effects that oxycodone had on my brain um, and then would lead me to withdrawals and all these different things, I would feel as though I needed um, more of it. Right. So anyway, I became very, very much addicted to um to these pills right and to the point of peter here where he says that those who escape from wickedness by knowing our lord and savior and then get tangled up in it again you're worse off than before i can speak to this right because i know without um i i know me right and when i made a clean break when when the the spirit of the lord delivered me from that addiction, I'm very clear that that is a road that I can never go down again, right? Because oftentimes with people who have addiction problems, when you relapse, your relapse is always worse than the time that you were actually addicted because you've been, you have been without said uh, things for so long that when you get back into it, you overindulge, right? Um, and ultimately you could end up dying, right? That's, that's literally, it's typically the relapses that lead to the overdoses in, in cases of people who are addicted to, to different types of pills and things. Um, and so Peter, I, I only use that just to give you more of a, 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 a contrast to what Peter's saying here. Um, the fact that if you get delivered from something and then you get back into it again, the end state is worse than the beginning, right? And these false teachers, they lure people back into sin by promising freedom. And this is similar to what Paul dealt with in Romans chapter six. He says, now that we've been saved by grace, should we continue in sin? Heaven forbid, he says, right? But these false teachers, right? Because I believe it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, um, he was... He was dealing with the, the problem in the Corinthian church, and he said, you say that um, I can do anything, right? But Paul says, 
just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should, because not everything that is permissible is beneficial. Right. So just because you have the ability to do it, that doesn't mean that it's beneficial for your spiritual growth. Right. And these false teachers will 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 play on that, this distortion of the grace of God, and they'll give it to you like like it is a credit card. Here you go. Now, come on, let's go. Let's go live right, because uh, it, it's not going to mess up your salvation. So we might as well enjoy life while we're here. You're going to heaven anyways. Right. There is a lack of accountability. Right. And oh, all that they're preaching, it just further entices you. And they may not come out and say, hey, let's just go have wild orgies and let's just go get uh, completely drunk and and high on everything else. Just just indulge all of your senses. They may not come out and say that. But again, remember, these are these are destructive, cleverly crafted lies. Deception, right? Deception is a little bit of the truth stuffed with a whole fat lie. You ever had a bag of chips that you got from the store and um, the bag looks full, right? Nice and full. Got your big bag, party bag, whatever. Only to open the bag and there's only half of the substance in there, right? So one half is all the chips. The other half is just air. So you open it. Air comes out. You could literally fold it over and only have half a bag of chips. Now, they didn't lie to you. They did not lie because there are Doritos in the bag. There's just not as many Doritos as you assumed based on the size of the bag. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the same thing with false teachers. They'll use a little bit of the truth, but it's stuffed with a big fat lie because the truth is God loves you no matter what. That is the truth. But they leave it open ended. Right. When they lure you back into sin. Right. Hey, it's OK. If you if you mess up, if you if you go and do this and, you know, if you just have a bad day and you want to go, yada, 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 sleep with someone else's wife, whatever. You know what? God loves you no matter what. I'm going to tell you, there's this there is this um, there's this documentary on Netflix called the family and it's too deep to get into the whole premise of what it's about but just i'll give you a scene that is the distortion of the truth right they were talking about um people who were chosen and they believe that certain people were chosen to be in leadership uh for the sake of god and all this stuff and they brought up king david they were talking about different people who were chosen and one of the kids said well king david was chosen he's like that's right king david was chosen and they talked brought up how he killed Uriah, slept with Bathsheba and all this. And the guy who was leading the discussion, he said, now, if let's just say one of you guys, y'all, y'all went out and you raped three girls. Right. So what do you think my response would be to you for that? And one was like, well, I mean, you know, it'd be bad. And I guess you would be mad or disappointed in us and all this. And he said, and then something else came up about just this this adverse response to them. He was like, no, because it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter what you did because you're chosen. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a perfect example of the distortion of the grace of God. That is a distortion. Because, again, we what we what he did not say, there was truth. There was truth there. Right. That King David was chosen. But the lie, the deception was and hell he had to pay in his household because of his decisions. So, again, they will they'll, they'll introduce these things, these half truths in order to lure people back into sin. And another point I want to make about that is that good like drug dealers, um, people who know junkies very well. They know that it doesn't take much to get them to come back, right? People who've gotten out of the game or whatever, um, they know the time period that withdrawals will start kicking in, right? And they're like, okay, well, we know we can't hit them up in the first 24 hours. They're they're good. But about hour 72, that's the height of withdrawals, right? And so they'll strategically, right? They know how to get them back. 
they they know how to play to whatever that codependent piece of that person is, whether it's drugs, it's um, attention, it's affection, whatever it is, they know how to play to it. I'm not saying just drug wars, but people, they know what makes people tick. They pay attention, right? In the same way, false teachers do the exact same thing. Because again, it says that these people barely escape. So these are new converts, people who are on milk, right? They don't know any better yet. And false teachers are able to handpick them. Why? Because the church is not teaching people how to spot the fakes. We're not discipling people. So therefore, they get saved literally out of a life of sin. And then they're introduced to false teachers who are parading the grace of God around like an Amex card. And there is no development. It's just, hey, you're saved. Here's your free pass. Here's the abundant life. Go have fun. And because there has been no transformation leading to personification, they take the grace card and they swipe to live the life that they want to live, right? Whereas grace should be used when we are pursuing Jesus Christ and we have a slip up, a slip up, boom, grace covers, let's keep moving because we're moving in the right direction, not swiping the grace card to go in the, the exact opposite direction, right? So again, he says, verse 21, it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. Well, my goodness. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness. With knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, comes responsibility. As you know better, you do better because look at this. It says, then to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. So here it is. You can't just take grace and start swiping that card to live any way you want to. Why? Because we read uh, a week or two ago that the command is, be ye holy as I am holy. And the only way that we are made holy is through us dying to ourselves and submitting to the power of the spirit so that the spirit can make us holy. They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. And another says a washed pig returns to the mud. I've had a dog before. I've seen a dog eat vomit and it's disgusting. Pigs always return to the mud. Why? Because that's a, that is an environment they are familiar with. Why do dogs eat vomit? I don't know. But every dog that I've ever seen at some point, if I see them throw up, they will in turn go and eat the vomit. And Peter says that's the same thing for people who have come out of a, a, a sinful lifestyle from the bondage of sin. And because there is no discipleship happening, right? It's just a matter of time before they relapse because of false teaching that they relapse and that they, the end of their life is worse than the beginning. And again, they prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to his vomit and another says a washed pig returns to the mud. So what does all this mean? Can you spot the fake? Ha hearing all of this, how do we spot the fake? Right. We we gave Colossians chapter number. Um, chapter number two. Right. That we have to continue to allow our roots to go into Jesus Christ to build our lives on him right continuing what we were taught and then now let's 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 sum this up with first John and then we'll be out of here first John chapter number two and it's a little bit of reading but we'll be here in the next uh, the next week or two so let's slide down to verse number. 18. It says, dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this, we know the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong 
with us. But you are not like that, for the Holy One has given you his spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. That is discernment, ladies and gentlemen, the ability to determine right from almost right. All right. Anyone and who is a liar, anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the father and the son is an anti Christ. Anyone who denies the son doesn't have the father either, but anyone who acknowledges the son has the father. Also, this is not just acknowledgement in words, but this is acknowledgement in deed. Right. What did Jesus say? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Why would he say that their hearts are far from him? Because from the heart, according to Proverbs chapter number four, verse number 23, it is um, everything that we do flows from the heart out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. Right. So people can put on a facade all day long. But put the right pressure on somebody, what's really in their heart will come out. Put them in the right situation, what's really in their heart will come out in their behaviors. So again, he says, anyone who acknowledges the son has the father also. So you must remain faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the son and with the father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised to us. Look at this. It says, I am writing... These things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Who wants to lead you astray? People who are anti-Christ in their words and in their behaviors. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. The ultimate way that we are able to determine the truth from the lie is the spirit that lives within us. So you don't need anybody, as the text says, to teach you what is true, for it is the spirit of God that teaches us all that we need to know concerning what? Jesus Christ. Let's go to John chapter number 16. John chapter number 16. Uh, here it is, verse number 12. There is much more, so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he received from me. All that belongs to the father is mine. This is why I said the spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So we see the consistency, right? That the spirit, as I talked at the very beginning, when I worked at the bank, we had a counterfeit. We had a money counter and in that it, it had the technology to detect um, counterfeit bills within us. Ladies and gentlemen, our counterfeit detection is the spirit of the living God. That when we hear something, now, wait a minute, that don't sound like who the spirit has revealed Jesus Christ to be based on the scriptures. Right. I'm not talking about the American Jesus. I'm not talking about um, the Eastern Jesus. I'm not talking about your own personal uh, vision of Jesus, the, the the frolicking brown hair and the 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 baby blue eyes, whatever, whatever picture that of Jesus Christ that you have. <clears throat> outside of what the scriptures have said is irrelevant. Right. Because the spirit is only going to reveal the Christ that the scriptures talk about. That's it. Not, not Jesus holding the AR, not Jesus um, at this all-inclusive um, lascivious living resort. Uh, none of that. No, no, no. Who have the scriptures talked about Christ to be? And that's the spirit. That's who the spirit will reveal. And it is the detection of the Holy Spirit. As you go two more chapters over in first John, that you are to try the spirit by the spirit. It is because of the spirit that we are able to detect false teachers from those who actually teach the truth. Again, we there were a lot of things that were pointed out to us today in Second Peter chapter 2 on how to detect these false teachers. And it says they're bold, they're arrogant, they are greedy. They lure people into sin with these uh, pervasive words, right? 
they teach things that are opposite of Jesus Christ. One of the biggest uh, fault, one of the biggest heresies that was happening in Peter and Paul's day um, was those Judaizers who were preaching that um, in order to be saved, you had to follow the law, right? They were perverting the gospel, as Galatians chapter number one, verse six says, right? They were taking away from the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, and therein is false teaching. So there's several things to look out for, and I pray that today you were encouraged on how to spot them, how to help the type of people that they may that they may prey on, right? Which is those who are unstable, those who don't have good footing, and it is the responsibility of the church to make sure that those people that we are around, that we are making sure that they are getting in this gym and they are building up their strength, right? We are teaching them how their roots go down into Jesus Christ. We are teaching them how to continue to build their lives on him. Because when we don't, they are susceptible to being taken advantage of by these false teachers. And they are here. They have one motive, right? That's, that is to indulge in their own sensual pleasures and they will devour whoever they need to to get it. They will rob you blind, right? Through cleverly devised lies to get your money. That's what Balaam did. Balaam was had a reputation that paid very well, right? And cursing or blessing people. Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, go read that story. He claimed to have great power, but when he was met with the power of the Holy Spirit, he tried to buy that. Why? So he could make more money and capitalize. So again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope that after today you are able to read 2 Peter chapter 2 and you're able to spot the fakes. And ultimately, it's not your naked eye that's going to get it done. It is the, what what is the Spirit saying to you? It's what's the spirit saying to you. And again, you've got to keep it. You have to. The simplest way to understand um, the spirit is when you hear something, when you have two opposing thoughts in your head and you say, well, here's how you here's how you ration this out. Is the decision that I'm about to make, is this going to make me more like Christ or is this to satisfy myself? And if the question is that it's to satisfy yourself. Then that's the decision you don't need to make. Because the Spirit's job is to glorify Christ. Christ's job is to glorify the Father. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for today. I thank you for clarity. I thank you for truth. I thank you that there are no agendas here. There's no hidden agendas. Um, we're not here to deceive anybody. We're not here to take advantage of anybody. But, Father, we are here to instruct um, through the illumination of your word. And I pray that um, for those who listen today, God, that they were encouraged, they were convicted, they were rebuked, they were um, they were humbled, Father. Um, because getting in the gym uh, is is essential. If we are not exercising daily um, through your spirit um, in the scriptures, Father, there is a great chance that we could be led astray by my false doctrine. So, Father, I pray that. You would help us to continue to cultivate that time with you each and every day to um, to learn from you, to be illuminated um, in the word by you so that we are able to help those who are in need uh, as well as help ourselves, Father, because we can't do this without you. And um, we know that the false prophets will be here and the false teachers. It's not our job to fight them. It's not our job to slay them. Father, it's our job to stand on the truth. As Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. That amongst all that Paul dealt with, he never lost faith. And so, Father, um, it's not that our faith will not waver at times because it will. That's just part of it. But ultimately, Lord, that we don't fall out of the faith because of the things that we experience or the false teaching that's going on around us. Father, I pray for my brothers, Marcus and Brenton. God, that you would strengthen them, give them clarity of thought. Uh, God, that you would in your spirit, in the power of the spirit, God, give them all that they need to speak boldly on their respective days father and i pray for aunt val the same exact prayer father that you would give her the strength lord to um, speak the truth of your word illuminate to her by your spirit uh, what is there on the pages god so that she may be able to strengthen and encourage herself as well as the hearers um, on tomorrow evening father we love you and we thank you for all these things in jesus name amen 
All right, y'all. Appreciate you for being on this morning. Remember, if it sounds like scripture, it must be found in scripture in the context of the passage, the context of the book, the overall context of the Bible. All right. There's so much to context. Um, and oftentimes that's where false teachers are good at because people don't know. Well, then they can be confused and easily duped. So, guys, please, please, please uh, make sure that you do that. Marcus will be on tomorrow. I believe I don't have confirmation, but I believe um, he'll be going on tomorrow evening again unless he otherwise uh, lets lets you all know. So prepare to see him tomorrow evening, probably between five and seven p.m. Um, in. Second Peter, chapter three. Yes. And then I believe uh, B will be on on Thursday, opening us up in first. Yep. In first John, chapter one, uh, between seven and seven thirty. All right. You guys have a great rest of your day. Talk to you later. Peace.